Professor Gina Rippon, thank you very much for being with us. Thank today. you very much for asking me. So, uh, you describe yourself as a neuroscientist and as a feminist. So, before we talk about your work, what, what is your journey to become both of these? Well, I've always, for some reason, been fascinated by the brain. Uh, and there's these kind of family myths that, uh, as a very small child, I used to cut open my teddy bears to see if they had a brain. Uh, so I don't know where I got the idea of the brain, but I thought it was really important. And I thought at the age of about eight that I might do medicine and be a brain surgeon. <laughs> and for various reasons, I actually went into psychology instead, but, but still the kind of psychology that was focused on the brain. So the idea of the brain is lifelong pas passion. And the feminist? I started at university, teaching in university in the 1980s, and it coincided with the so-called second wave of feminism. And the university I was at was very politically active, and the town I lived in was a politically active university town. And so there was a lot of feminist activities, a lot of um, consciousness raising women's groups, etc. So I absorbed feminism that way um, and made me realize that that was really part of, of my interest in neuroscience as well. When did you first make the link between these two passions? Initially, they weren't linked, and I lived a kind of split personality. <laughs> During the day, I was a very sort of technical um, neuroscientist teaching undergraduates all about brains um, in particular. I will confess the difference between males and female brains, um, and teaching them to use very complex technical equipment. And then in the evening, I was I I involved in feminist activities, but I was also teaching in a, a sort of feminist-inspired uh, evening classes, talking to women about women and mental health. And that drew me very much into um, feminism. But at that time, the idea was that we should get rid of any idea of biology. There was a movement called biological politics, which said this is, you know, we must forget that biology differentiates males and females. Females can do anything. The only reason there are gender gaps is because society has constructed them. And so there seemed a, mis a disconnect between, you know, the brain is all important and the brain has got nothing to do <laughs> with gender gaps. And once I started looking at the research, I realized that there was a very powerful link between the two. In particular, the idea that there is kind of some kind of belief that brains are different, which in a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, mm. um, people start to believe, oh, I'm, I'm a girl, so I can't do science. You know, I'm a boy, so I'm good at maths. Um, and, and trying to address Yeah, that. and actually, you wrote a book. You published Gender and Our Brains in, in 2019. Um, and the, the subtitle is How New Neu Neu Neuroscience Explode the Myth of the Male and Female Minds. Um, so, what, what are the myths of uh, <laughs> female and male minds? Well, uh, the biggest myth is uh, that there is a female brain or a male brain, that you can, in fact, sex a brain in the same way that some of those police procedurals do on television. If somebody picks up a, a femur and says, oh, that's a 34-year-old female or something, you can't do that with the brain. And, but there's been a very powerful belief right from the end of the 18th century that there was some kind of difference between female and, and male brains. At the beginning, uh, that female brains were inferior, <laughs> which explained female Obviously. inferiority. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest myth. But there's also, particularly with respect to science, the idea that there's some kind of science-based um, ability to think spatially, which is really important in science, and that this particular gift is given to male brains, <laughs> not to female brains. Our brains, men's and women's brains, are similar, the same? Just our behaviors are different? Yes, a great caveat, in fact. Um, people say, oh, so you're a sex difference denier, which is one of the politer things I've been called since the book was written. Um, no, I don't think male and female brains are the same, because I think that every brain is different from every other brain. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, males and females will have different brains, but not necessarily, or maybe not even primarily, because they're male or because they're female. So I think brains are different, but not because they're male and female. But what, of course, we're interested in is uh, gender gaps, if you like. Um, and of course, there is this sex differences in the brain and gender gaps, and those terms are quite important. But we really want to understand 
why it is that there are these gender gaps throughout the world in sort of high-level political representation, but right through to the kind of careers that, that people choose to do, um, whether or not they stay in those careers. So trying to address the behavior bit is really important. When, as a parent, you want to try to raise your, your child without gender difference, well, well, the boy and the girls then... Uh, Will you see in the imagery of their brain similar things? Yeah, well, the idea of raising um, children gender neutral is the term that's yeah. used. And when parents ask about that, I think, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think it particularly in the 21st century, Uh, the world has become very gendered, particularly in, in the Western developed world, and there's all sorts of coding messages out there about pink and blue, what I call the pink and blue tsunami, and don't get me started on gender reveal parties. <laughs> But I think that parents have to realize that however well-meaning they are with respect to gender neutrality, and of course they are because they want the best for their children, there are all sorts of other pressures that children are exposed to. And we know that babies from the moment of birth uh, arrive in this world with highly tuned social radar. So they're already picking up, you know, what makes me different, how is that difference valued? So it's, it's a very hard job. Uh, and I think it's even harder in the 21st century. You said, you said before, before you made a reflection on saying that was some of the nicer things I was called. <laughs> so that means that your research did not please everybody, that you had um, backlashes? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Yes. Um, I mean, I think one of the headlines, I've actually incorporated it in my, my Twitter page um, from a female journalist on a, a mainstream UK newspaper, said my work smacked of feminism with an equality fetish. Um, and I kind of love the idea that if you're interested in equality, it's some kind of perverse practice. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a long-standing certainty which clearly resonates well with how people want the world to be organized, particularly the people in charge of the world. So if there's a nice fixed biological explanation, then you can say, well, you know, um, it's nature, boys will be boys. So you have a kind of get-out clause. So there is that kind of um, pushback. But there is also pushback from people who have tried various, uh, what they claim to be sort of diversity initiatives. And then they say, um, in inverted commas, science has leveled the playing field, and yet, you know, in the most gender-equal countries, there is the proportionally biggest underrepresentation of women in science. You're also well known for your state-of-the-art brain imaging work uh, around dyslexia and autism. Uh, I believe you would say that autism is considered a male condition today? Yes, that's right. I mean, the narrative around autism is actually quite a nice case study where if you have a particular belief, that's what you see, and, and the evidence and the research is, is focused towards that. Early brain imaging studies in autism were only done on boys because it was a belief that you know, mm. it's, it's a male uh, condition. But I think it's clear, as it's emerging, that there are very, very many girls and women on the spectrum who have gone for years, decades sometimes, unrecognized, because the diagnostic dice, if you like, are loaded against people realizing that they have the same difficulties, because they say, you can't be autistic because you're a female. Um, mm. And I have actually heard that said. And it could be the case that because a whole aspect of autism is, is kind of social behavior and interaction with other people and being aware of social rules, if girls, there is more focus on girls acquiring that sort of knowledge, mm. then it may be that girls on the spectrum um, have that sort of advantage or an awareness of the importance to them of social rules. So they can kind of camouflage the difficulties they have And very often when you work talk, around it, yeah. yeah so they realize, how do I get to belong to that gang? And, and you yeah. mimic the behavior. And you can do that up to a certain stage, but very often the change, for example, from primary school to secondary school, mm. life suddenly becomes much more difficult. So girls to that age have sort of been flying beneath the radar and camouflaging their symptoms by learning a script because it hasn't come automatically to them. But all of a sudden, the world just gets much mm. too complicated, complicated for that. You have a word, neurotrash. <laughs> 
What, what does neurotrash mean? Neurotrash. Uh, could explain why I'm not that popular with certain journalists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the idea is, I mean, there's, there's a kind of um, range. I mean, there's what I call overall neuro nonsense, because at the beginning of this century, once brain imaging arrived, there were these wonderful, compelling images which seemed to fit in well with people saying, particularly relationship counsellors, I mean, that... The, you know, the, the, the granddaddy book of them all, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women yeah. Are From Venus, all of those self-help gurus kind of hijacked these images and you could find them in all sorts of Sunday newspapers or, or self-help books, etc., without any kind of explanation for what was being shown, other than that there was a, a, a red blob and a blue blob. So that's why people just really didn't understand what brain imaging was about and how complicated it is. So that was a kind of the neurotrash end, and you got things like the neuroscience of Bob Dylan's genius. <laughs> um, but then there is also a slightly more concerning aspect, which is Cordelia Fine has coined the term neurosexism, where there is a very fixed belief that understanding biological sex differences in the brain is all you need to do to address all sorts of gender gaps, and only asking are my participants male or female, not asking what occupation have they had, what experiences mm. have they had, what education, means that you miss really, really important data. You say no hardwired differences in male and female brains, but you, you talk about neuroplasticity and brain training. Can you explain that a little bit further? Well, the key issue is the... The, the trying to get rid of the term hardwired because that goes back to this idea that there's some kind of essential difference and that brains, once they'd reached their developmental endpoints, were fixed and wouldn't change. And so if you had a male one or a female one, mm. that was it. But we started to realise, certainly with brain imaging, and really only in the last 30 years or so, that our brains change throughout our lives. So the experiences we have will change our brains structurally and functionally. Um, and there's some really nice studies, for example, looking at musicians, um, musicians who play keyboards, you can see asymmetrical asymm activity in the motor cortex in the brain, whereas string players, because the, the, the hand movements are asymmetrical, you can also right. see that in the brain. So the plasticity was important because it meant we had to look at the experiences that people had. We, we couldn't just say, this person is like this because whatever is programmed their brain has made it like this. I mean, this brain has had certain experiences or hasn't had certain experiences. We can retrain. Should we retrain? It's a great metaphor. And I think it's really to say that you can overcome difficulties. Um, and certainly with respect to brain damage, for example, we now know a huge amount more. Because we know the brain is plastic, people actually will um, invest time and effort in, mm -hmm. into people reacquiring functions that they've lost. So yes, I, I, I think we can retrain our brain. We can always benefit from any experience that we have. So you, uh, you're a researcher, but you have also entered policy debates. <laughs> uh, why did you want to get involved in policy making and, and what, what does this add? Right. Well, um, how does this add value? It goes back to the sort of underrepresentation of women in science and also because part of my outreach activity was going into schools and, and talking to schools about science and brains and being a researcher and coming across time and time again really, really bright girls. At the age of 14 in the UK, you can almost choose not to do science. Um, and girls saying, oh, you know, I, I haven't got science brain or maths is a boy thing. And then you realise that, that science which desperately needs scientists of any kind, is losing out because of this kind of lack of awareness in education, mm. um, for example. And therefore, I, I got involved in... in um, just recently, there was a, a commission on the effect of gender stereotypes in the early years looking at education and saying we need to really be aware of the effect that we are having on our children of a gendered classroom... Um, you know, pictures of male scientists on the wall and assuming that girls couldn't do these spatial tasks, etc. I think it's getting the word out there mm -hmm. um, and talking, knocking on doors, uh, making people call things out. This is a stereotype. It is harmful. And, and the recent changes in um, Lego, for example, and, and in Fr the French government has, has now um, legislated against gendered marketing of toys 
And I think that's a really great step forward because people think toys, you know, just a bit of fun. Yeah, but that. it starts with small things. <laughs> it does indeed. And yes. so, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's very interesting because w what we just talked about makes it clear that getting girls uh, into science is very multi-factor. Yes. Uh, and not just an easy, uh, um, well, talent or interest That's or right. brain. It is there are many factors yeah. coming into and it. And keeping them in science too, because exactly. there is this claim that science has leveled the playing field. And I do wonder <laughs> where people who make that claim have actually been. So I think it means that science itself also has to look and say, what is it about the climate of science? And you only have to look at, at evidence of bias in, in publications and Yes, of course, because very often we then say women do self-censorship. And I think that is making them carry additional responsibility for being either discriminated or a little bit pushed out of yes. career paths. So we have to be aware that, um, that there are many, many elements playing together to bring girls into science and keep them. Yes, and, and to help them be prepared um, to make mistakes. That's another thing too. There's a great phrase by Reshma Sujani, who founded Girls Who Code. We raise our boys to be brave and our girls to be perfect. And I think that's the basis of a lot of difficulty. If something goes wrong in a challenging environment, very often the female will think, I'm, you know, I'm not up to this, I better, I better leave. And um, I think that's something which is really worth pushing back against. Yeah, so I think, thank you very much. We should finish on that phrase. Uh, boys are, are raised to be brave, girls to be perfect. So we, we need to try to be a little bit less perfect. Yes, probably. indeed. <laughs> Thank mistakes. you very much, <laughs> Professor Gina Rippon, Thank you. for being with us. Thank you.